some people may tell you to do your dream on the side. And that's because they could be afraid for you and they're uncertain about your future. But as long as you're in control, your future's great. It's Nephi Anderson here with a special episode of The Path Less Travel, a web series spotlighting millennial entrepreneurs who successfully turned their passions into lucrative careers. Now, today's guest isn't a millennial, but her story is so amazing that I just had to have her on. Yes, I'm talking about writer, photographer, and storyteller, Shermel Edwards. Hi guys. So let me let me give you the rundown on Shermel. Shermel is most known as being the founder of thecoffeetographer.com, a webzine that unfolds the diverse and complex world of coffee culture. Now, when you go to her site, you're not gonna find coffee reviews or even listicles on the best place to get it. No, 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 that, that's not the place for that. But what you will find is a highly curated experience of images and editorial pieces on coffee as it relates to culture and the human experience. Now, Shermel's coffee expertise has allowed her to be featured in outlets such as Business Week, The Washington Post, Serious Eats, and now the Pathless Travel series. Shermel, thank you for allowing me to interview you today. Thank you for having me. Um, I know there's going to be some great gems. So just like at church, when they tell you, you know, take a moment to take out your Bible, I need you to take a moment to take out your phone and make sure that when you tweet all the commentary and all the juicy tidbits that she shares in this interview, you use that hashtag TPLT series. You got that? All right, so let's start from the beginning. Talk to me about when you realized that coffee was something that you were passionate about and how you made the decision to kind of like let that lead you into your career. Um. I think I realized that coffee was important to me when I was leaving corporate America. Important to the sense of like I wanted to do something right. with coffee, right. like create something with coffee. Right. So that was like around, I left corporate America in 2009. Okay. And around 2007, I started toying around with the idea about what I could do and I was living in Park Slope at the time mm -hmm. here in Brooklyn and there were shops like specialty coffee shops popping up and I saw them and I was going to them like I had you know I went to coffee shops in LA where I'm from but I just didn't see myself there mm -hmm. I didn't see not just representation mm -hmm. but culture like I didn't see that culture reflected in in, in print or other things that I was reading about the culture and so that kind of like begun the spark for me right yeah okay so I just want to go back a little bit yeah. so talk to me about why you left corporate America mm -hmm. and did you know that you were leaving corporate America to be an entrepreneur yeah I think I've always had entrepreneur leanings because of my parents mm -hmm. and I've always tried different things um, but I just knew when I left corporate America that I I didn't want to go back. Yeah. What were you, What did you do? I was working in ad sales okay. at Business Week, and I was there for almost four years. And I did some writing there too, which I enjoyed. Right. And I was trying to fit myself into the system. Right. You know, trying to do more of what I love while being in that system. Right. And it wasn't working, and I realized that it wasn't working because it wasn't where I wanted to be. Like too creative for such a structured environment. Right, I love that. It wasn't working because it wasn't where I wanted to be. Right. You have to listen to yourself sometimes. Oh, you do, I talk in the mirror all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, talk to me about what you did to deliberately brand yourself in this coffee space. Um, you know, branding for me is a new term because I grew up as a writer. I didn't grow up as a person seeking out visuals or being brand oriented. Right. I've only become brand sensitive as a result of the coffee photographer. Okay. Like I can say like, I know what the arches are for McDonald's and what that means or that's supposed to look a certain feeling. Mm -hmm. And I used to think that I would one day like write coffee, I mean, not coffee, but like commercial jingles. Right. 
Um, so I understood like that part of it. But the brand thing is still new to me. I'm still figuring out like what that means. I mean, even when I started this, I didn't start it as a brand. Mm -hmm. I started it as a place. Right. You know, an online place to curate a culture. Right. And to give voice to a culture that I felt needed one. So talk to me about your definition of what the coffee photographer yeah. is or what a coffee photographer is because mm -hmm. immediately I feel like people just think that it's just, you know, coffee. a person that takes a picture of coffee. Mm -hmm. it, would you say that's true? Um, well, coffee photography and the coffee photographer was not in the lexicon before. Okay. Right? There, there wasn't anything, like if you Googled it, it didn't show up. Right. Right? Like, right. I Googled it. Right. Didn't show up. Right. So, no, but that's like you trademark that too, right? That's your. Well, that's you your, know, we're, yeah, you yeah, know, that's it's your thing. <laughs> yeah, you well, created, she created that, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm saying it's like when I created the coffee photographer, the noun it was me, the person mm -hmm. going out performing these actions. Okay. Coffee photography was the actual photography, okay. and it was, and I still define it as such on the site, an emotive response to the people. So it's me having something happen inside of me mm -hmm. that says, oh, that person is interesting mm -hmm. or that person is giving me something mm -hmm. and I need to go document them. So it's not necessary. So it doesn't necessarily have to do with coffee. It hardly coffee. ever has anything to do with coffee except right. the fact that it's in a coffee shop. Right. Maybe they have coffee with them. Maybe they have tea. Yeah. But it's the fact that in this environment, which is a microcosm of culture, right. that's where I'm centering my focus. Right. That's where I'm finding them. Right. You see what I'm saying? Right. But with the rise of Instagram, coffee photography became very popular. Right. So it's kind of like I was doing it and then Instagram kind of came. Yeah. And then I eventually got on that bandwagon. So one thing that really struck me is like your your conscious your differentiation between like a blog and a webzine. Mm -hmm. So why do you call your site a webzine instead of a blog? Well, because I look at the culture as something that is changing, but I look at it as a voice of a culture, not of like me as an individual person, even though I am its muse and I am curating it, right. right? So I feel like a blog can be driven by like maybe one interest or a person or their voice. Right. And so I'm saying that there's things happening all the time. Right. And most print magazines or webzines will have a focus and they'll have a theme and then each month that theme is played out. Right. So I'm playing out themes weekly. You know okay. what I mean? I'm playing out what's current and popping in pop culture in coffee. Right. What's current in music playing in coffee shops. What's happening right now in art in a coffee shop right. around the world. Right. So it's not driven by my voice or my content, it's the culture's content. Right. Right. And it's a little niche and it's a little different and a little quirky and it's a little weird at times. And that's what a zine is. You yeah. know, it's a little bit offbeat. Right. And I'm offbeat. Right. Really. So what would you say were some of the opportunities that you created for yourself that led to your big break with the coffee photographer? I was shooting in coffee shops a lot and I'm bi-coastal so I spend most of the year here but then I'll go home for the winter. Okay. And a friend of mine was working at Blue Bottle. Okay. in Chelsea okay and I've been wanting to shoot fashion and portraits of people doing fashion week in New York because wait what is blue bottle coffee shop okay it's a specialty coffee shop that that's what I was thinking but I was like mm -hmm. wait call, okay all right yeah 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 <laughs> so um I was visiting her and she said well are you gonna come to fashion week and shoot around and yeah. I was like she's like you know milk studios was right here right right and I was like yeah I really want to but I'm a little nervous and she's like girl just come yeah here's a schedule I think that was like the energy universe everything yeah. telling me like just go ahead and do it um and you see from afar like the coverage that comes out of fashion week right but I was just like I know all these people are taking coffee breaks yeah. Like, they're drinking coffee, they're getting tea, they're grabbing a bagel or, or something. Right. And I want that fabulousness 
on my site. Yes. I want to capture what that looks like yeah. in this special time of the season. Right. And I tell you, like, I went out there shooting with, like, people that I would end up, like, now that I know shoot for, like, W and L. And it was, like, this is a camaraderie. It was also this thing, like, well, who are you shooting for? I'm like, oh, myself. Yeah. You know, like, well, what's that? Mm -hmm. Oh, this Smidler, because it wasn't a couple photographer then. Right. But once I started doing that, the focus came on me because it was like, oh, Refinery29 was shooting me or Vogue was shooting me yes. or Essence was shooting me. And I was like, oh, this is weird. It wasn't like what I thought, you yeah. know? And then people wanted to know, well, who are you? And yeah. what do you do? And I told them what I did. I was like, oh, that's like really different and niche, but that's like really cool. Yeah. So I think that was a turning point because I went out to the street in a different way. Right. Just because I was pulled by it. But by right. doing that, I like opened myself up to this whole other world. Yeah. And I think that that's what's cool about bearing left. Even yeah. if you don't know it, but following intuition, like something happens, you go, I think I want to do this. Yeah. And it presents itself. Yeah. And you can act or not act. Right. If you don't act, it will come back again. Right. If you do, then you just propel it. You know what I mean? Right. That's awesome. So two things that I got from that. So one, I got that like, you know, we need to like give ourselves permission, right? So often, Always. oftentimes we wait Always. for somebody else like, yeah, it's okay or whatever. But it's like, give yourself, you are good enough. Like give, you know, yeah. don't be the first person to tell yourself no. And then the and second- follow the hunch. Follow the hunches. What would you say is the hunch? That idea that's in your head that's saying, what if I did this? Right. Or I wonder if. Right. Um, I think I can dot, dot, dot. Yeah. I'm curious. Like, all, it's, it's something that you know is, is, is that little voice. Right. It's in, in Shonda Rhimes, she said a piece with TED Talks on her year saying yes. And yeah. she was like, it's the hum. Yeah. That kind of hum of like working and adrenaline. But it's that thing inside of you that if you get really quiet, you can hear it. You can hear it. I love it. You can hear it. And I think the second thing that I got was just that, well, I already knew this, but you're a fabulous yeah. fashion darling. Because oh, I feel like your you. fashion is like the window <laughs> in which... That, that, you know what that scared me? Really? Yes. And my friends, when I started doing fashion, they were like, are you afraid that the fashion part is about to go with the coffee part? And I was like, mm -hmm. what are you talking about? Yeah, because not everybody gets featured in Vogue Italia, darling. Not everyone. No. So what, did, what, was, what was your response? Are you afraid? Or like you know what I think because I grew up as a writer yeah I was more focused on what was on the page okay and the stories that the people inside of me were creating right right so with the photographer and the advent of social media it's become more about you right like even on my Instagram feed you don't see me show myself a lot I'm working on that yeah but um, people want to see the person yeah. behind it and I'm just like Oh, I'm not important. Like you'll see me through this thing, right? But um, I think it's a little daunting because I'm just like I don't have enough clothes. Right. I have beauty marks. Mm -hmm. I don't have the perfect skin. Like mm -hmm. all these things. So it's just a little bit awkward and weird. Right. Like, I'm at home. My friends are in the mirror. I'm good. Yeah. But it's like the vogue Italian black is like, hey, could you stand right there and do this or? Where'd you get that from? It's like your own sense of style, just what you naturally do, right. becomes what someone else likes. Right. It's cool, but it's a little bit like daunting. Yeah. So there's so many layers to like your authenticity, but I mm -hmm. feel like what sticks out to me, like this is me like not knowing you like personally. Yeah. But you stay true to yourself in like every sense of the word mm -hmm. from like your fashion, which is why people gravitate towards you. Mm -hmm. I mean like what, how often do you see people? I wear this all the time. Yeah. Like, but how often do you see that? What would you call uh, this? I is don't a, know. Uh, I don't what's, the, what's the proper name for this? Um, it's a, it's a like, it's a jumper. It's a flight suit. Yeah. How, okay. You don't see people like that often. That's, n yeah. that's number one. And that's kind of like, that's part of your signature. But number two. You know why I became my signature? Why? I wear what I'm comfortable in. Yeah. And because I believe that comfortability is the biggest key to being yourself and creating the best work that you can make. Right. Like if you're not comfortable in, in yourself, in your skin, in yeah. your energy, yeah, you're not going to create great work. Right. That's why some of the best artists, like if it's Picasso or whatever, or Steve Jobs, black tea, blue jeans. Mm -hmm. Like they don't want the fuss of the other stuff. Right. Or if they have a more diverse wardrobe, it's just that they wear only what they love. Yeah. 
like only what they love. Right. Jeans, this signature. Right. Jumper, dress, shoes, kick socks, whatever. Right. I was just raised that you have the right to express yourself. Right. And that expression doesn't mean that it is the total of who you're always going to be. Right. But if it's a season of your life or right. a fragment of your life, you have to at least get it out and explore it. Right. You know what I mean? And I've always been that way. It's very hard to hush me. Right. Like the inside of me. Right? Yeah. And that's because my parents always said that we could express ourselves. Right. I've probably taken that to like the umpteenth degree. Yeah. Because there were times where it was like, that's it, Chevelle. Yeah. And I would still talk. Right. You know? Right. So what would you say is one thing that most people don't know about your career journey to where you are today in regards to the coffee photographer? Most people don't know that it hasn't been so loving in coffee culture for a woman of color. Really? really? There's, there's just, and I don't talk about it that right. much because I just, I don't know, I guess sometimes I feel like giving voice to it doesn't empower the conversation at times. Right. But then I'll find that in some conversations that'll come out, like women in coffee, women of color in coffee. Right. I think even being a writer of color in coffee. I didn't even know that there was an issue or there was like there was a hurdle to get over oh there's hurdles a big part of coffee culture is competitions you know and so a friend of mine and i we went to a coffee competition early on when i started this and i was like in love i was hooked what do you compete with because like you what do you you it's compete like on like written stuff or you compete on like coffee. making coffee yeah with okay. making coffee okay. so you like the old competition it just changed and the last year used to be three com three coffees mm -hmm. uh espresso mm -hmm cappuccino mm -hmm. and a signature drink without okay. alcohol mm -hmm. and those are 15 minutes and it was done to music okay. so when I went to my first one in New York I was like what's that music what's that song what does she say why is she wearing that what is she doing why that table setting what right. silverware like all the accoutrements of what a culture has right was there right and I'm like there's no way I can't cover this right right and I thought that was really cool right and so I went home that night and I was like I'm covering this Right. And there were other people who were covering it too. And that's cool, but I was really into the music part. Right. It was cool until it wasn't cool. Mm -hmm. It was cool until like, you know, these people are sponsored to do this work. Mm -hmm. And here you are like this independent doing it. And it's like, mm -mm, that's not cool. Mm -hmm. So when you are talked about and bashed, mm -hmm. it's hard. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. really hard when you're, when you're forwarding something that you believe in and it's not popular or there's hurdles to get through. There's no manual, man. Right, yeah. So what would you say was like your last career low and how did you bounce back from that? Because to your point, you said that there is no manual for this. Right. And I just want people to know that like you will have career lows, but you are going to bounce back. Yeah, when I got priced out of my place and I, and I had to move, I didn't have a lot of income, right? right? And so, I used to every week take my clothes and sell them for coffee. Like really? Mm -hmm. Wait. Wh yeah. A cup of coffee is not just a cup of coffee to me. Yeah. It's an experience, but that experience goes all the way back to some farmer on a piece of land who is spending probably nine months out of a year growing that coffee. Yeah. And there are times when that farmer won't have enough money to eat. Right. They call them like the lean months or something like that. There was a film about that. Mm -hmm. And that really touched me. You know, yeah. it's like when I go places and people offer me coffee for free or they comp it or there's an event, I'm really grateful. Mm -hmm. You know, but I never ever walk in expecting that I'm going to get something for free. Right. There's no free lunch. There's no free anything. Right. You know, everything has a cost. Right. If someone wants to absorb that cost, that's cool. Right. But as as the writer, as the journalist, as a coffee photographer, right. when I walk into that shop, I need to be able to afford what I'm doing. When you think about like, you know, you're paying for your site, you're paying yeah. for licenses, you're right. paying for a lot of things that it takes to maintain your work. Those things add up. Right. So if you only have so much coming in and so much coming out, what are you gonna sacrifice? Right. right. So he will say, like, what's the hardest part about being an entrepreneur? I had this new thing because my sister's getting married. Okay. 
People tell you, like, you date, you get married, whatever. Mm -hmm. And they give you all this advice, right? right? But you don't really know until you get into it. Yeah. Nothing can prepare you for that first year your husband gets sick mm -hmm. or you realize that, oh, my God, he smacks food and I can't stand it. Yeah. And he's never knew it. He gets so comfortable or loses his job or whatever. Yeah. And I feel like being an entrepreneur is like a marriage. Right. You're dating. Right. Until you cut the tie that is that fixed thing that's mm -hmm. going to fuel the resource or the income mm. right you're dating until right. you go out there like full-fledged right that's how i look at it right because when you're married to it and you're committed to it right and it's the thing that keeps you up at night and right. it's a thing where you go oh my god i can't pay for someone to call this for me right. so i'm gonna have to spend as many days as it takes to figure out this code day after day while you still have to maintain and still have to work Right. Because you can't afford the coder. Right. Right? Right. You're married. Wow. So that 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 commitment to me is like what makes me not look at the other things as like real hurdles mm -hmm. and more like the journey. Right. Because I can look back and I see my sacrifices. Right. And my sacrifices are because I can't not do what I do. Right. That is not an option. So how do you generate income? Well, so what I did last year was I created something called the Coffee Stories. Mm -hmm. And they are short stories, because I love to write. Right. But they're imaginative stories about coffee. Okay. And I basically tell coffee shops or brands or roasters, allow me to tell your story through a creative lens. Mm -hmm. So most people tell stories about origin, where coffee is from, or roasting, and that's cool. Right. I used to read those stories. Right. But they don't necessarily always interest me. Right. I want to be taken somewhere. Right, right, right. And so I'm like, what if I created my own story system? Right. What if I got people to believe that I could tell their story and give it further voice? And it was a hunch. Yeah. I told my dad, and he was like, go for it. Right. My mom was like, "Well, why would why would they pay, why would they pay you to do that? Like, right to make she was playing devil's advocate, right. which was really good because I was like, because I'm a coffee photographer. It's yeah. about it. It wasn't so much about why would they. It's about what I felt the culture needed. Right. What I felt I needed, where I had grown, and what I wanted to do. Right. And because of that, I'm like, this is one revenue stream. This is now a revenue stream for me. Right. And I'm providing a service." And I know that I have an audience, and I feel that this audience needs this service. Right. But it's something I want to create because I'm a creative. Right. So that's one way. Um. So to be clear, so you write this story, and then it lives on your site. It lives on my site for the duration of that frequency. So you can have a story for two weeks or a month. So it works like an ad. Mm -hmm. So I basically created my own ad system within my zine. Wow. Right? So if you go onto my site, there's no advertising. Right. And I don't do advertising. Like right. I decided, like three years ago, there would no, there would not be any banner ads or anything like that. Which the question everyone asks: Well, how do you make money? Right. I just kind of felt I didn't want something popping up influencing my readers. This is you being authentic again, because <laughs> that is like one of the number one ways that anybody with a website or digital presence mm -hmm. is like they're trying to make money off of anything and everything. You give me fifty bucks, I'm gonna put your ad right. on my Instagram. Right. You know. Right. Yeah, and um, yeah, I didn't want to do that. Okay. I didn't want to do that, and I don't do it. So, where, so do you? So and I don't do affiliate networks. Like people approach me, and I tell them I don't do it. But last year, I was gone for a year from New York, and okay. in that year, I tasked myself. Where'd you go? To LA. Okay. So I went home for the winter, and then I stayed. Okay. And I was like, I'm not going to come back until I am sustainable through my site. Right. So if the task was to become more sustainable where like I can have this minimal lifestyle. Right. Like don't focus on clothes. Don't focus on stuff. Right. Not that I'm necessarily am, but like if this is what it takes for me to live, very minimal. Right. If I can make that, I'm successful. Right. Right? Because right. then I get to do what I love without having to compromise that and go work for someone else. Right. So the coffee stories are one of those ways. And then collaborations and right. sponsorships. So my thing is like, now when people come to me, I just say, listen, this is a platform for original storytelling. Right. This is a, a platform of curated culture, created culture, mm -hmm. right? 
And I understand that you want to be on here. Right. And that's cool. Right. But if I choose you, that means that I actually like what you're doing and I think that you're making a contribution to that culture. Right. Because my site is not about covering everything. Right. Like I'm not trying to like have like five stories a day and like fake click. Like right. I don't care about that. Right. So if I'm gonna be niche, I'm niche. Right. So if I'm gonna invest in your story, I need you to also invest in this platform. Right. So here's my sponsorship packages. Right. Should you choose? So be it. Right. And if you want to do a project or hire me individually, mm -hmm. these are my rates. And you know what's so crazy? Like, I started that uh, last summer, mm -hmm. and it's like crickets. Like, people love you until there's dollars. Right. And I'm okay with that because you know what that means? I don't have to deal with all the other noise. Right. Like, if you're really serious and you really want to make work with me, like Seth Godin says, right. that matters. We're gonna work together, we're gonna create together, and we're both gonna feed together. Right. Right? It's kinda like DJ Khaled. Don't play yourself. Yes! You know what I'm saying? I love DJ Khaled. How business. DJ Khaled, I'm trying booming. to get you to like adopt me. I know I'm a little DJ older, Khaled. but like we can work something out. Business is booming. Yes! Booming. Vays, the vays. Yeah. You know? And the vays, I think they're not necessarily always specific, but the vays are the people who like. Can you link to me on my site? Can you just tweet about me? Why are they asking you this? Right. Because Kevin Hart, who I love as well, says if you have one follower, a hundred, a thousand, or a million, it doesn't matter. You have an audience. Right. And if someone is coming to you for your audience, that has value. Yes. If you don't understand that value, why would somebody else? Right. And the lessons happen over and over again because sometimes some person is bigger comes and we go, can I charge that much? Yeah. I think you got to get to a place where you got to say, like my dad would say, what is this worth? Right. Right? So now I think about the clothes I've sold. Right. I think about the fact that I have puffy eyes. Right. You know, I think about the nights where I had no help to figure out this code. Right. And I think that it's not a sad thing. It's just that I'm figuring it out. And right. once it's figured out. Yeah. I will become that unstoppable person in my mind that I see and I'll get to really curate the culture and be with the people right. and be on farms and be in markets and yeah. tell stories and like make my great grandmother proud. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like I am proud and I'm happy, right. but there's just so much more that I want to do. So what would you say that you are doing on social media mm -hmm. to strategically and creatively further your brand? Um, that's actually a good question. I think you asked me off camera what was my favorite platform. Yes. And I think that it's Twitter. Yeah. I love Twitter. Yeah. Um, I think Twitter is a combination of like me personally mm -hmm. and my brand as well. I think my brand is, is influenced by the soul of who I am. Right. So when I'm talking to Twitter, I'm talking to myself. When I'm retweeting something that's happened in Paris or Germany or Norway, it's for me too, right? Yeah. So I'm educating myself as I'm also educating the world, right. but it's also like me telling you what I think is important. Right. And that's important to me because whether, who knows where Instagram will be in five years or Snapchat or anything like that. Right. But what I'm doing is what I've always wanted to do, which is create a platform that documented a culture. Right. If I died tomorrow, like Zig Ziglar, and, and Les Brown say, you know, who will you have been? Right. Will you be, will you have been a meaningful specific? And that lives with me. Mm -hmm. You know, like at the end of the day, my cultural work, right. well, I have given the world enough meaning mm -hmm. where they can look back and see the work. Right. Right? Not necessarily me. I'm right. in the work. Right. But see the work. Right. And that's what's important to me, the work. I love it, I yeah. love it. And so, you know, a big audience for your work <laughs> is your Instagram platform. Yes. So, you know, we can't forget about you guys, the supporters. So we posted a question on Instagram to see, you know, what you guys wanted to know from the coffee photographer herself. <laughs> so let's see what the people had to say. Hey, Oh, we got some good stuff. Okay, all right, all right, okay. Well, Lewis and Gregory asked a question that we already kind of touched on, which was, you know, what would you like people to know most about your journey? Right? Do you feel like yeah. you covered that? Mm -hmm. 
Um, and what would you like to see in coffee's future? I would like to see the professionalism and the care of hospitality as an industry, as a service, mm -hmm. brought even more into coffee shops. So I know a lot of recess cater to customers, right. but I would like for, just as coffee is known to be a food, I right. would like for coffee to be considered part of the hospitality industry. Um, and I would like to see more voices writing about coffee as a culture right from their perspective more right. women of color too i love it mm -hmm. and so we have some great questions here a lot of them we kind of touched we already haven't touched on so i'm very excited about that okay so it's underscore carrots not paris not carrots wants to know what are some experiences related to your non-traditional path that have helped to shape your journey as an individual mm. I think having the experiences where you have to sacrifice, mm -hmm. where you have to make choices, where your friends are maybe going out for drinks on a Friday night and you're thinking about your editorial calendar. Right. You know, it's the choices where you can decide to spend $30 on brunch. Right. Or have it for a measure card for the week. Right. And that decision comes because your, your resource may be limited or your funds are limited. Right. So it's, the journey is the decisions that you make that keep you married to the journey, right? So there's a lot of things that you can have and those things aren't bad, right? you know? Um, I remember when I gave up my, my magazine subscription. I love reading print, I love reading magazines. And right. when I had to stop, it was like mentally for me, I knew things were changing. I'm like, right. oh, this is gonna be rough for a while. Right. Cause like, how do you not afford magazines? Right. You know what I'm saying? But right. it's like the little things, you know, the little things that no one thinks about. Right. That you have to give up to stay on the journey until you can have them again. Right. I love you. Just I'm like lost in your words <laughs> because you just, you know, the stuff that you say is impactful. But then the way that you say it, uh. I'm just like, girl. <laughs> and so the last question, because I too am a fan. I just want to know, um, you know, like, what are some things that we should take into consideration when choosing coffee to drink? When you walk into a coffee shop, you're the customer. You're buying something that you're gonna put into your body. Right. Right? So you have rights. As a customer, you have a right to ask about what you're going to buy before you buy it. Mm -hmm. You have a right to ask how it's gonna be prepared. Right. The person behind you may not want to wait for that, or the person in front of you is gonna give it to you and I wanna provide that. And most times they will. Right. So you never have to feel disempowered walking into a place. Right. The power starts with yourself. Right. Right. And it is just a cup of coffee. But what makes that cup of coffee more complex is its journey. As all of us are. Right. Right? We're not just human beings we're complex because of all of our stories right so i want you people to know like you can walk into any coffee shop you're the customer and you can ask as much as you need to in order to make what you're getting accessible for yourself right so based on that <laughs> on behalf of everyone on the other side of that screen i just want to thank you for having the courage for having the patience, the mm. perseverance, and the authenticity Thank to you. turn your passion into your career. Thank you so much. If you guys enjoyed this video as much as I did, I need you to let me know. I need you to like, I need you to comment, I need you to subscribe, I need you to share to all of your social media channels, and then I need you to head over to thecoffeetographer.com and have a cup of coffee while you're doing it. Until yeah. next time, bye. Bye.